This video is brought to you by Brilliant. More about them in a bit. I want you to imagine that you've been born into a black and white house or room. You've lived in that room your entire life. Everything that you see and engage with and your clothes and even let's say your skin for one of our reason is somehow monochromatic. And so everything you perceive is black or white. In your isolation, you've been tasked with understanding the world. You can access all the physical information about the world. You know that other people talk about colors, that they talk about colors of red and blue and green. You've never seen red, blue or green, but you know that there is a physical process which activates certain receptors in their eyes depending upon the wavelength of light, which gives an experience of red, blue, or green. And that these colors, when combined, create a very colorful and dynamic picture for those individuals. You know everything about it top to bottom. All the physical information is provided to you in your confinement. Now, someone comes along and opens the door. You can leave the room, and you can finally go outside to the normal, colorful world. Have you learned anything new? That is Mary's Room. That's a thought experiment created by Frank Jackson, a professor arguing against physicalism. Physicalism, as he defines it, is the metaphysical theory in which everything is reducible to physical information. So if something is true, it can be explained and its truth can be reduced to physical information. Now, the point that he's making in Mary's room is that if you leave the room and you gain knowledge, that knowledge couldn't have been physical. And if that knowledge couldn't have been physical, then physicalism is false. So that's what we are talking about today. Should you think of the world as merely physical? <laughs> Hello, my fellow philosophers. In today's episode, we are discussing physicalism. Physicalism is the theory that everything is reducible to the physical, that if it is true, it can be given in physical terms. So what is the physical? Why should I believe in physicalism? And what are some common arguments for physicalism? And does it actually obtain truth value? Is physicalism correct? Physicalists are individuals who wish to affirm that physics can actually explain all of reality. Everything's physical. Everything in life is physics, you know that? Your heart beats because of physics. You can see because of physics. You can hear because of physics. You can smell because of physics. You can walk because of physics. You can have sex because of physics. Most people arguing for physicalism argue for physicalism for one primary reason, and that is the case for causal closure, which is essentially that everything can be causally explained within a single unified causal sequence. So there's a beginning, middle and end. They all relate to each other in such a way as to be causally accounted for within a single system. And that is essentially what is called the exclusion principle in which everything can be reduced to physical causation. You see, if I can reduce everything to a causal sequence of events, let's say my perceiving of reality is, to, you know, from the resultant from my experience of light, which traveled from the sun, my being here and my biology, which is the result of biochemical processes, which are themselves the result of mechanical and physical laws, there is a sequence of events which can be traversed backwards in which every single aspect of my being and my experience can be accounted for causally in physical terms. How I came about, how the human species came about, how the elements which make me up have come about, all of these seem to indicate that every event is causally explained by a prior event which is going to bottom out in a mode of physical causation. The next is more methodological. It has to do with the acceptance of science. 
Maybe you're a scientific realist. I know I am. I believe science actually brings information, facts about the world. And that those facts about the world, some will argue, indicate the truth of what is called physicalism. That everything can be reduced to physical information. It's just we don't know how to reduce it to that physical information. And so these are the number one reasons for believing in physicalism. The sort of rejection of physicalism is the opposite. That physicalism cannot explain or the physical cannot explain consciousness. That it can't explain experience. What it, it, what it means to feel something can't be explained by physical information, but can only be explained by consciousness and a relation to consciousness, which even if it was produced by physical information, is separate in kind from physical information. So you can see how this is essentially shaping up. You have those that want to reduce everything to a physical external reality, and a physical, the physical laws and mechanisms of an external world. And you have others who argue that maybe it can't be reduced to that and maybe it is dualistic or maybe it is um, something else entirely. Now, the there are people who try to overcome the issues in Mary's room and we will get into that later. But let's talk about what we even mean by physical because that is really one of the biggest issues I have with this whole theory. Now, if you ask most people, and even the dictionary, if you check, it'll say physical is something which is concrete, real, or external, as opposed to that which is mental, or believed, or fictional. So the physical world is something that is characterized not simply as having a specific kind of existence, although many people will reference things like material and physical laws, but also as being external from an individual's perception. So what it is and where it comes from is that if we are perceiving something, it is the thing that we are perceiving. If we are looking at something, it is the thing we are looking at. It is the world in which our senses gain information from. Okay? I don't think anyone would really have a problem with that. Although some people undoubtedly will. So the physical is really a reference to an individual's sense experience and the possibility of a world which that sense experience is formed by. So if I'm perceiving something, it, that perception is conditioned or created by light bouncing off an object, hitting my eye, and then my interpretation of that object is essentially the is essentially bound to the object through a causal mechanism. That causal mechanism is external to my perception, but my I can perceive it through my perception. So we have what is a mind independent world. It is something which is objective and it is contrasted and defined against the subjective, the experience, the seeming, the uh, the, the the thoughts and feelings of an individual internally rather than the external mind-independent world. This is entirely the mind. It is entirely the ideas and experiences of a subject. Now, the problem arises for physicalism, as you'll have seen from Mary's room, when we try to reduce that subjectivity down to the physical. Because if the physical is def is defined as that which is objective, and we try to reduce the subjective down to the objective, then we're essentially hitting a brick wall. Because it is defined against the subjective. The internal experiences are exactly where physicality is supposed to end. And the mental life of an individual is exactly where ideas are supposed to end according to this kind of thinking. And so the real issue comes about is, is this thinking correct in the first place? So are we right to define something as physical information and something as mental information? It seems that we can make the distinction that, you know, if I was to die, the world might still exist. And, you know, if I'm to hallucinate, it's not that there are those hallucinations or physical manifestations in the world. So 
it seems that we can perceive that there are two distinct areas of analysis. However, physicalists would like to reduce this to the physical. And so what are their proposed solutions? This is where you get theories of what are called epiphenomenalism, for example, in which, okay, the mental life of an individual exists, however, it is non-causal. So it has physical origin, you know, it, it, it is produced from a physical reality. However, it doesn't actually affect anything. It has no definitive existence which relates to the world. And that's going to be a hard pill to swallow for people because it seems that our mental lives have a direct relationship to how we live our lives. Some other people will say, no, they don't. And in fact, they are produced by our behaviours. And so our behaviours produce our thoughts, but our thoughts cannot produce our behaviours. This seems to go against even physical analysis, things like brain plasticity and cognitive therapy and how it affects the neurology of the brain. It seems that our thoughts and our feelings have a direct impact upon the physical world, which is our brain. So even if that brain is producing that mental realm, which is itself something distinct from that physical realm, it seems that that mental realm is having an impact on that physical realm and we can gain that information from physical analysis. So how are we going to account for this? Well, these are the problems for physicalists. They have to account for qualia and qualia is really the contents of your experience. So not only do they have to account for the contents of your experience, but they also have to account for whether there can be non-physical truths about the contents of your experience. And one of those truths is what it's like to experience something. And it seems that what it's like to experience something is a seeming, a subjectivity. And that subjectivity is non-physical. At least it hasn't been defined as such. So an attempt to define it away hasn't really worked. And so we are left with this kind of dualism, right? And a dualist believes that there are two different kinds of things, that there is the mental and then there is the physical. Okay, and that's one kind of dualism anyway. So a dualist might believe that there is mental information and that there is physical information, okay? Now, now that seems to explain a lot. You could say, wow, that seems to really get past this problem. So we have the truths of the subjective and then we have the truths of the objective. But that doesn't actually make sense. You can see that the subjectivity of an individual seems to have real life purport. You know, the, the mind of an individual affects the brain, it affects their behaviours, it affects a great deal of things in relation to the lived experiences of individuals and how they engage with an objective plane of existence. But more than that, that means that there has to be a point in which the mind can be considered physical and the physical can be considered mental. So how would that be possible if everything is reducible to two separate incompatible substances or foundations? If something is mental and something is physical and something can only be described as mental or something can only be described as physical, how can they come together and be explained in the separate paradigms? And do, do they need to be? Well, the example I gave you before seems to show that there is a causal link which implies that in order to gain knowledge of one, you are going to have to have knowledge of the other, which implies that the that you cannot reduce physical truths to the physical and you are going to have to reduce some physical truths to the mental. And likewise, you are going to have to reduce some mental truths to the physical. You know, someone takes a drug, you might actually be better off understanding the biological processes involved in that drug so that you can express and explain how these mental states are, uh, are, are appearing to the individual so that they can gain an insight into the development and their experiences of their own bodies, for example. Okay, like elevated heart rate might be increasing your anxiety. And so it's not that you're actually scared of spiders, it's that you're having, uh, your, your, your heart rates went to 150 and you, you might be having a panic attack. So there is that utility. But it goes deeper than this. And the way that we can understand this in the historical relationship between what is physicalism and dualism. This debate has been going on for a long time and the debate itself originated from an entirely different philosophy. And now a word from our sponsor, Brilliant.org. Brilliant.org is the best new way to learn maths, computer science and data science interactively. 
with thousands of lessons from basics to advanced topics, it's fun and interactive for the busy person on the go. If, like me, you're interested in learning a wide array of topics but just simply can't find the time, you'll find Brilliant is a great way to engage on those topics that you've been putting off for years. My favorite course is on logic because with logic, you can build a strong foundation for all other forms of learning. And with the addition of a little bit of science, you can look into the philosophies of physicalism and dualism in much more detail than your average person. If you're interested in trying Brilliant, it is free for the first 30 days and the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Now, back to the video. I see through you. So let's go back. Where does physicalism come from? Well, physicalism is actually a term that's often used in parallel with another term called materialism. You might be more familiar with this term, the belief that everything in the world is reducible to the material. You know, it's reducible to matter. It's fallen out of favor for numerous reasons, but primarily because physics doesn't believe everything's reducible to matter. Everything's reducible to either energy or the physical mechanical laws of the universe. So materialism isn't really the bedrock of itself. It came from the Catholic Church. Well, kind of. The Catholic Church was one of the most dominant socio-political organizations in human history, traversing from one side of the world to the other and lasting many thousands of years. And so the Catholic Church had a great deal of influence in philosophy. And philosophy at the time was also what we consider science. Science at the time was called natural philosophy. So it wasn't seen as something radically different from philosophy that only started to develop at the time of materialism. And the church was Aristotelian. Most people don't realize this, but Catholics and Catholicism can look towards a great deal of its philosophy from ancient Greece. Catholics such as St. Augustine were inspired by Plato, and Catholics such as St. Thomas Aquinas were heavily inspired by Aristotle. And through the use of these philosophies, merged it with Christianity and Abrahamic traditions, or saw it as useful and viable to understand the truths in the Abrahamic traditions, and so took many of the methodologies that were expressed within ancient Greek philosophy and applied them to their theorizing. And the dominant form was Aristotelian theorizing. It was Aristotelianism. Now, Aristotelianism and Platonism and all ancient Greek philosophies were really formed around what was a consideration of universals and particulars. A universal is a form, an essence. It is shared amongst various specific beings. So there is a table here and there is a table in the other room and all of these tables share the same tableness. They all share the same essence. That would be a universal. However, their particularity would be something like their spatial location. There is this table and then there is that table and in their particularity they are different, in their universality they are the same. Now, the Catholic Church had a massive debate on this and it was put forward by Boethius at about 1000 AD and this idea, do universals exist? So there are multiple groups here. There are those who believe only universals exist. And that everything is reducible to the universal because it defines what exists. You know, if it exists as something, it exists because it has the essence or the form which makes it exist as something. If it doesn't, then it has no explainable reality. So why would I say it exists? It can never obtain itself. It can never identif be identified as something, which means it has no real concrete existence. So all that exists in truth is beyond. It's something that is more probably heavenly. It's an archetypical idea in the mind of God or a platonic form prior to the Christian interpretation of this. Then came the Aristotelians. The Aristotelians were more mediated. There are these universals and yes, they maybe kind of do seem separate from the objects, but not in another world. They are the thing that is shared amongst all objects. And the particular existence of that universal is its existence. And so if there is a particular of it, it can be said to exist. 
And if there is a particular, it can only be understood because it has universal existence. So everything is both universal and particular. Then there are what come to be known as termists and nominalists. These are people like Rosalind, Abelard, William of Ockham, and especially towards the Protestant reformers, you see this become highly popular in people like Luther later on. And these people believe that everything is particular, that there is no such thing as a universal. Why should I believe a universal exists when everything I see is particular, when everything I engage with is particular, when every thought in my head is a particular? Why should I believe in a universal? The only thing universal about them is the name I'm giving them. And that even led to two groups. Some saying the name was a real thing and had genuine existence. Only in the mind, but it had existence. Others saying it doesn't have any existence at all and is just something we use to throw a bunch of things together that look alike. Both Protestant groups wanted to say that Aristotelianism was wrong. You had very prominent Protestants like Luther reject Aristotle as a heretic. You had Protestants like Francis Bacon, the forefather of modern science, saying everything is particular. This led to nominalism and this kind of particularism in which everything is to be understood in reference to the particular concrete existence which is external from my perception. It's what I sense. And so all information is gained from the senses. And we have the birth of what comes to be known as empiricism. And empiricism is essentially that all knowledge is gained through experience. Experience of what? Well, particulars. Okay? And is contrasted against an alternative tradition that was arising at the same time. So in Britain, empiricism was the dominant philosophy. The philosophy of Thomas Hobbes. The philosophy of John Locke. And in Germany, there was rationalism. Rationalism is the exact opposite. What is known is reducible to the idea, to the mental, to the universal that exists separate. Now, that universal doesn't exist in a world of forms, but it exists in our minds. And so you have Descartes and Leibniz, radical empiricism, and this radical rationalism. If, if, it, if it can be known, it can be known through reason. And it can be known through reason alone. If it can be known, it can be known through observation and observation alone. Rationalists believe there had to be innate ideas which structured the rational capacities of an individual to understand the world around them. And so you get this Cartesian doubt in which everything is reducible to the I, the I, I think, therefore I am. And you also get the empiricist rejection of this sort of merely, uh, this sort of radical psychology, but also an adaption of it into Lockean empiricism. Yes, okay, I am constructing the world with my mind, but only because the world is impressing upon me and constructing my mind out of particular experiences. Okay, so now you're starting to see really how materialism, or specifically dualism and materialism came about. You have your rationalists who are looking towards dualism because observation doesn't explain everything. Everything can't be explained through particulars. We need some sort of universal. That universal is likely to be an idea. And that's what gives an expression to the particulars and makes them understandable. And likewise, there are the empiricists who are seeing the exact opposite. Actually, the ideas themselves are formed only through particular experiences. Okay. And so the objective-subjective divide was really established very hardly here, where there is this object and there is this subject, and it's because one side wanted to reduce everything to universals and one side wanted to reduce everything to particulars. But this whole tradition was a rejection of a tradition prior to it that said, actually, and this is Aristotelianism, actually, Neither side can do that. I would argue what we are seeing with physicalism and the issues of dualism that I've already mentioned is the fact that neither side seems to succeed. We can't say that everything is reducible to the physical, to the external world, and we can't say that everything is reducible to the subject or a combination of subject and object held absolutely distinctly. Dualism. So it needs to be able to do both. It has to explain the mental and it has to explain the physical. 
Now that seems to be a tall order, but I don't think it's actually that difficult. Or rather, it doesn't have to be that difficult. So I would argue the best explanation comes from the tradition that was rejected, namely Christian Aristotelianism. And Christian Aristotelianism argues that there is both a mental component and a physical component, or a objective and a subjective component to reality, but that these components can only be understood together, and that they are irreducibly the bedrock of reality. Then this is what's called hylomorphism, that there are multiple component parts to what is an irreducible single thing. So if I was to give the example of steel, steel is a combination of carbon and iron in varying proportions, and in order for you to be able to say that something is steel, you can't say that it is simply just iron and reducible to the iron, and you can't say that it is just the carbon, that it's reducible to the carbon. Now this is only an allegory, because what Aristotelians are arguing is that there is this mental component, there are the idea, there is this universal, and there is this physical component or concrete particularity, the existence of this mental, this idea in reality, okay? So it's not just possible, it is actual. And it's, if it's actual, it's possible, okay? If there is particularity, there is universality, and if there is universality, there is particularity. So it's this back and forward where everything is essentially explained in relationship between these two. So for example, a zebra is a zebra because it contains the essence, the, 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 what would be called the species essence of a zebra. What makes a zebra what it is, is a form. It, it's an explanation of what are the boundary conditions of that species. What's separated from other species that make it definable in terms of its relationship to other objects in the world. Those conditions exist objectively. Okay, any zebra is a member of the species zebra, and the, the species of zebra can only be said to exist because zebras exist in the world. Now, I think that is fairly intuitive, and I think that it actually seems to make the most sense. Okay? So, it's mental and physical. There is information which is not physical, and there is this information which is physical, and the only way that you can actually gain either of them is through the unity of the two. Okay. So, I think the greatest example of this and the person that showed that this, this dichotomy needs to collapse was Hegel. Hegel I take to be an Aristotelian. Many people might disagree with me. I will argue they're wrong. But I will say Hegel is an Aristotelian. And he argued for a very similar conception of subjectivity and objectivity. And argued that in the end, they must collapse into each other. Because what we define as subjectivity comes from a creature, and what we define as objectivity also comes from a creature. They both come from the conscious experience of the world. Now, that is to say that there is the conscious experience of a creature in the world, and there is the fact that you are also the world having a conscious experience. <laughs> okay, so, you know, atheists typically like to say the universe doesn't care about you right? But they typically forget that we are the universe and that you're actually arguing that there is this radical separation between humanity and the universe. So at the bottom, what Hegel is saying is that you are subjective and you are objective. Your subjectivity exists in the universe and is defined by its existence in the universe. And likewise, the universe is defined by your relation and existence in it. And this is where you get absolute idealism. Absolute idealism is the belief that everything is reducible to the absolute, the unity of the subjective and the objective. The subjective being the particular experiences of an individual, and the, the objective being the externalized perceptions of the individual, or that which the, the individual is perceiving. So, how do we get in those distinctions? Hegel says if you start from the point of an animal, it becomes clear. An animal has an internal experience, an internal identity and it externalizes that internal identity onto the world in terms of desires. And so the subjective paints the world that is objective to it in order to be understood. Why? Because it doesn't want to die. Because it wants to eat. 
because it wants to have sex and have a nice house and whatever the hell animals want to do, that's what animals are engaging with. Likewise, why have animals come to exist? Why has the world produced something which is gaining in complexity to the point in which it is experiencing itself and trying to understand itself and engage with itself? And it's because there is an underlying goal in the universe. And that part of that goal includes the capacity to gain truth. You see, truth is causative for Hegel. It is the unity of being an essence. It's to say something actually exists. And to say something actually exists, well, you're going to have to be able to portray it in such a way as it's categorized. So you're going to need a mind. And so to have the essence, you need to produce a being which is capable of producing essences in order to exist. And so it was necessary. Consciousness couldn't help but form. The universe will always produce consciousness. And likewise, conscious beings will always perceive an objective universe. They won't be just locked in their own heads for all of eternity. They will have to engage with an objective reality or perish. And so you have this unity of the subjective and the objective. That's a very basic explanation of Hegel, but when you get into that, it means that not only are they mutually dependent, but that reality itself, if reduced to either side, becomes unknowable. And it becomes unable to be navigated and understood, and you have the issues with physicalism and dualism. Instead, if you merge them together, and you say, actually, it's not dualistic, it's monistic, so it is reducible to one thing, like physicalism says, but that thing includes both the physical and the mental, then you don't have the problem anymore. And so you have what is an objective world with subjects living in it, and both truths are the result of what is an objective subject. And so you have spirit, the spiritual ground from which all reality comes to exist. And Hegel is going to say that absolute spirit is God. And so we are all subjects living in an objective experience that is the product of an absolute mind, which is the unity of subjectivity and objectivity as absolute truth, which is God. Okay, might sound far-fetched for some of you. I think it offers a great deal more explanatory power than something like physicalism or dualism. Let me know what you think in the comments and I will see you in the next episode.